فرصة حلوة طبعا واحد متواجد في الجامعة الرائع دوت بنشكر دكتور أحمد شاش ودكتور مها جميل على المجهود الأكثر من رائع ودكتور أماني في التنسيق بيشرفنا جدا نقدم بروفيسور لوران سليمان هي ذا دايركتور أوف ذا ريجنال أناستيزيا فيلوشيب أند أكيوت بين سيرفيس ديبارتمنت أوف أناستيزيا كليفلاند كلينيك إن يو إس إي where I promise you uh, 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 a lecture is really wonderful. It's one of the best lectures you can ever listen to. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Rafi. Now I was inspired by the theme, the theme of the conference, which is, is there a gap? So I came up with the question, is there a really a gap in what I'm doing every day, post-operative pain? Do we have a gap in the approach for post-operative pain? And I think there is a gap. There is a gap because there is no improvement. And if we, have, if we see the same problem over years and years and it's not improving, then there is a gap. I'm looking at post-operative pain incidence over two decades. So the first study in blue, it basically was done in 94. Then another one in 99, and a third one in 2014 or 15. And you can tell that pain has been the same. Same incidence, the severity have been the same between slight, moderate, and severe, almost the same ratio. So really, even though there are so many studies, there are so many trials, so many suggestions how to improve, we didn't improve much over 20 years. So there is a gap. I ask myself, what are the challenges for post-operative pain? And there are three major challenges in my mind. First challenge was try to provide adequate analgesia for post-operative patient, which means adequate pain relief, which it's, on its own, it's a fundamental human right. Every patient deserves a good pain management. You should not suffer because you're having surgery. We have been shown that adequate pain treatment and adequate analgesia can give you a better patient outcome in, in terms of economic as well as in terms of physical status. So it should improve your outcomes. Now it's a major risk factor too, many studies suggesting that it can be a lead to chronic post-operative pain. So by far we need to do a better job controlling pain for all this reason. So that's the first challenge. But trying to control pain also leads us to the second challenge which would be the opioid-related adverse outcomes. Most of the opioid we use have tons of side effects, have tons of complications. And these complications include both physical as well as economic effect. And we're going to discuss that quickly. But there are side effects that comes with adequate analgesia. Lastly, one of the biggest challenges we are facing now, especially in the USA, is the epidemic, opioid epidemic, and they blaming us physicians on creating what we call an opioid epidemic, one of the worst crises in healthcare that we've been facing. So I would like to update you on this. But the prescription of opioid, the diverse and abuse of opioid have been increasing over the years. In terms of side effects of the opioid, they all share same side effects. In whatever route you're giving, parenteral, IV, epidurally, IM, transdermal, oral, they all have their profile of side effect at a different rates, at a different incidence, but they all have the side effects. So we're familiar with these. And all of them, there is no safe opioid. All of them have the side effects. Fentanyl, morphine, dilaudid, hydromorphone, so fentanyl, with different level, but they all have side effects. So we're, we're familiar. We're creating some problem by giving opioid. On the economic side of the story, opioid have been shown to increase your cost of health cost by 56%, as well as the length of stay by 69%, for many reasons. But patients who suffer from side effect of opioid have been shown to cost us more and stay longer in the hospital mainly due to ileus. Ileus is one of the biggest reasons why it costs more to give opioid, and it, costs, it, it makes you stay longer in the hospital. And the relation between opioid and ileus have definitely shown 
proven, documented, the more opioid we give, the more alias we're gonna cause, the more cost gonna happen, and the patient gonna stay longer in the hospital. So this is one of the major issues we have, or the challenges. Now, I updated you before on the last few years on what were, was going on, and we had the ERAs, the bundle payments, the change in the health system in the US, how the reimbursement gonna change. I would like to use this chance to update you also on what's happening, the opioid epidemic. So more and more people are prescribing opioid for post-operative pain. Actually, we're looking at, in 2012, there was 259 million prescription of opioid for different reasons, chronic pain, acute pain, but different reasons. But it's been increasingly going up. It has been assumed that this is the highest prevalence rate of an illicit drug other than marijuana that's been abused. Now, if you look at the green curve, that tells you how much opioid sale been going. So it's been going up. Going with it, the number of opioid deaths per year is keep climbing, and the opioid admission for side effect of, of opioid. So it's gradually keep climbing that we're giving more opioid, we're treating more opioid side effect, and we're killing more patient, patient giving opioid. They look at the number, how much did that cost, the US, and it looks like per year, the treatment of opioid, it cost us around $72.5 billion per year. So it's a huge cost on the health system as a side effect. In a nice retrospect data, they were looking at the number of opioid pills prescribed for surgery patient and how much has been used. They found that out of 40 pills, 10 pills per use, 30 pills were thrown or they were diverted. They were used in another way. So that's a huge number. It's two-thirds of the pills are not used. And if you don't trust me that we call it an epidemic, if you look at the number, there is every day in the US 91 people is die every day from opioid-related overdose. That's more what car accident and gunshot causes. So that's became a huge health problem. The first lifetime exposure to opioid most probably gonna be through post-surgical pain. So patient who had surgery, you expose them to the opioid, he got hooked up to the opioid, and then we can end up with the disaster. So the economic burden is huge. In 2015, 63% of drug-related deaths involved opioid, and this number have been an increase from 2014 by 15%. So the numbers are going up. I don't have the 2017 yet, but it is still going up, the number of deaths related to opioid. That creates a huge epidemic. Now, the opioid can be actually the lead to other addiction, mainly heroin. And there's a lot of articles now describing that the OR is the gateway for heroin addiction. The number of heroin addicts has been climbing gradually. It's more than doubled between 2007 and 2012. And we think that OR can be a reason. People start with morphine or opioid. You write them a prescription. With time, they don't have the access to the opioid. So they start to look for something else. So the curve of the morphine goes down, the curve of heroin addict goes up. People just look for another drug as a replacement for the morphine that we gave them. I hope that the video runs. We tried it before it didn't run. But the media, actually this was an ABC News report two weeks ago. CNN, ABC, Fox News, Wall Street Journal. There's tons of articles now addressing the opioid crisis that the U.S. is living. They are describing it as the worst in the U.S. history. Is the opioid crisis that we're living, and it's called opioid epidemics. So, remind you again, that major challenges. I need to provide adequate analgesia. It's a patient right. It's a better outcome. I have to avoid side effects of opioid. I try to limit the opioid epidemic. What shall we do? The first thing we start to work on is to avoid the opioid monotherapy. What is the opioid monotherapy? A lot of physicians still are using opioid, then more opioid for more pain, and further more opioid for more pain. So we're going from one opioid to two drugs to third drugs or stronger drugs. This is a opioid monotherapy. So the first thing is we need to shift this. That has to change totally. So we need to move to the multimodal. What's a multimodal? Multimodal means opioid is only used at the top of a pyramid where everything else fails and you have a breakthrough pain. It is not your mainstay. It is not your everyday drug. Actually, mild to moderate pain, you should start with acetaminophen, NSAID, 
coccyps, gabapentinoid, local anesthetic, non-pharmacological. You move to moderate to severe pain, you give neural blockade or peripheral nerve blocks, regional anesthesia, ketamine. Finally, if you have a breakthrough pain, you use opioid PRN. So the concept of multimodal counts on using opioid as a rescue. That take us to the pain management. If, how do we think about acute pain? Acute pain starts with peripheral injury of the tissue. You do a cut, it's a major trauma to the tissue, you created an inflammatory process, and you created a lot of signals. These signals are gonna go along the peripheral nerve to the CNS, and from the CNS going all the way up to higher level in the brain. And that create on its own, this pass, and every single it pass, it's gonna create a cascade of inflammation with multiple mediator, and we start to realize that these mediators have so many roles in the process of pain, in the process of inflammation, in the tissue damage that happened, in the post-operative comorbidities. But these mediators are not essentially blocked by opioids. They are actually blocked by other medication other than opioid. So why don't we work on these mediators to minimize the stress of pain, to minimize the trauma that happen with it? So opioid should be only at the breakthrough level. So we start to think of different levels, and we start at the tissue level. We can start with non-pharmacological. I'm, I'm sorry if it's not showing in the back. I'm going to try to read it. But then start at the tissue level. You have the non-pharmacological techniques, and that typically can be massage, can be electrotherapy, can be cold. Now, to move up, you can use pharmacological intervention, which opioid can be part of it, but local anesthetic, injection of local anesthetic into the wound. That help. Cold, ice. Silicoxibs, NSAID, acetaminophen, they all work at this level. At the peripheral nerves, there are pharmacological, non-pharmacological, local anesthetic does work really well on this area. Now also, opiates have some role, not that much. Anticonvulsants and anti-inflammatory works great. Transcutaneous electric stimulation may have a good role at this level, at the peripheral nerve. Also, massage can help, acupuncture can help. So there are different levels. At the level of CNS, Spinal cord, local anesthetic, for sure. Acetaminophen, anticonvulsants. Also using anti-inflammatories. At the brain level, clonidines, ketamines. So there are multiple things that we need to do. In general, we need more than two analgesics working at different sites within central and peripheral nervous system to reduce the pain and reduce the amount of opioid we use. So that's the concept of multimodal. As an update, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with these techniques, but as an update, I'll summarize to you that was in, came in uh, 2015, trying to put recommendation looking at all the articles, all the randomized trial, looking at different multimodal technique. What's been recommended? What's the evidence? So strong recommendation, high quality evidence that we say offer multimodal analgesia. Variety of medication of non-pharmacological, like transcutaneous stimulation, cognitive behavior therapy for the treatment of perioperative pain in adults and children. So this is a strong recommendation based on high quality evidence. What else is a strong and high quality evidence? Neuraxial analgesia with opioids and or local anesthetic for major thoracic and abdominal procedures, particularly in patients for prolonged ileus or cardiac and pulmonary complication. We have enough quality, high quality evidence to give this recommendation. Consider surgical site, specific peripheral regional anesthesia technique is another a strong recommendation with high quality evidence. Use continuous local anesthetic based peripheral regional anesthesia, peripheral nerve catheters, when the need for analgesia is likely to exceed the duration of a single shot. There are enough evidence to say that that is a good practice. Use topical local anesthetic in combination of nerve block and the very specifically in neonatal mere circumcision, which it used to be a major problem for children. Moderate quality evidence said that the consider of use of perioperative dose of oral salicoxib in adult patients who do not have contraindication is a good practice. So if you can do it, you have some moderate quality evidence to support. Giving NSAIDs in patients without contraindication and or acetaminophen. And when we give them, the recommendation is to give them round the clock for the duration of injury. So somehow depend on the surgery, 
five to seven days, depending on how major is the surgery. But round the clock, acetaminophen and or NSAIDs. That's a strong recommendation. Gabapentin or pregabalin have to be considered. If you have to use opioid, better to use IVPCA. If you have to give systemic opioid, use it. Do not use a routine basal infusion. Just PCA pump without a basal. Avoid the use, and this is a strong recommendation. Avoid the use of IM route for administration of analgesics. You should not do any IM morphines anymore. Now there are multiple studies looking at intrathecal magnesium, benzos, neostigmine, tramadol, and ketamine. It became at moderate quality evidence to use it or not. Intraproral analgesia with local analgesic for pain control is not recommended. It didn't show that it does help. And this is coming with high quality evidence. Now, weak recommendation means we don't have enough data. We cannot tell you, is it working or is it not working? IV ketamine, even though most of us will agree, it does a great job. But in the long, it's the bigger picture, we don't have enough evidence to give it as a strong recommendation. We say it, it's a weak recommendation. Consider it. Consider adult undergoing open and laparoscopic abdominal surgery, IV lidocaine. There are some data specifically for this surgery. Can it be expanded to other surgery? Maybe, but we have some weak recommendation here. Transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation have been shown, and again, very early result, that it can help. So we recommend it, but very weakly. Cognitive modalities. Try to relaxation technique, diversion technique. They're trying music. They're trying to involve them in other activities to be able to control their pain better. That has been shown, but the steps of recommendation are weak, that you should use it. Take you back, multimodal, it doesn't come without risk. There is always a risk, especially talking about surgical patient, elderly patient, you're giving them two to three medication. There is always a risk of polypharmacy, and there is always a risk of combining side effects. So it has to be very carefully planned. Now, your goal in multimodal is not an additive, not to add one plus one equal two in the drug. So I'm adding Tylenol to, para, to uh, NSAIDs and morphine, I'm gonna receive three. No, my goal is to find what can help each other. So it's a thoughtful use of using two medications that have synergistic effect to each other. So one plus one should equal three. If it's one plus one equal two, probably you're gonna run into also side effects, one plus one equal two in the side effect. So your goal is to carefully pick what are you gonna use to achieve your goals. When you combine drug, you carry the drug-to-drug -drug interaction, and it can be a pharmacodynamic where both drugs have the side effect, augment each other, benzodiazepine and opioid, both have sedations, you're gonna increase the pharmacodynamic side effect. Or it can be pharmacokinetic, where the absorption and metabolism of one drug can affect the plasma level of another drug. That's a pharmacokinetic. So that's also have to be sort of. Now that brings up alert when we see uh, that sorry, there we is. Got, we got two minutes to sure. go. Thank you. We get cases with really lethal deaths, 13 days old who died from a prescription of Godin to the mother. And we figure, how did that happen? Healthy patient get codeine, a small dose, and died. How did that happen? We figured that there is a gap, that a gap in what we call a pharmacogenomics. We are not created the same. We differ from each other, as Dr. Uh, Himimi was saying. There is a difference in our genetic constitution. Now, the pharmacogenetic is a study of entire genome. There is more than 400 distinct genes that can influence pain. Out of this 400, there's a short list of 10 genes that really can affect our practice. One can affect the metabolism of the pre-opioid. So there's, we are familiar with the cytochrome P450 family, and the cytochrome P450 family, what it induces, it can introduce the codeine into oxymorphone, and also it more potent opioid. So there are four phenotypes. We have people who ultra-rapid metabolizer will form a large dose of morphine, where people who have extensive metabolizer, which are normal, people who are intermediate metabolizer, and people who are poor meta metabolizers, so they do not benefit. So both the ultra metabolizer and people who are poor metabolizers 
most of them, we should avoid certain drugs, that the pro-opioid drugs. We should avoid codeine as well as tramadol. Should be avoided in this patient. In the ultra-metabolizer group, that you're gonna increase your toxicity risk. In the poor metabolizer, you're not gonna benefit them. So that's one gene that we can find. There are four genes, unfortunately for the time, I'm gonna run through them, but there are four genes that's been accepted that they are the map. Now, is that applicable, is that clinical? I'm just gonna take the last minute describing two studies. One come from Lebanon. They looked at the complication of opioid and are they related to any genes? And they were able to look up back on their patient and they said, the dose of morphine that the patient requires after surgery depend on the age, the weight, the duration of operative surgery, and on some genetic mapping. And they looked at the genetic mapping and they were able to tell which patient is going to require more morphine up to seven times more than other genes. They did a great thing that they said, oh, if you have that gene, your likelihood of having morphine is seven times more. Your likelihood of the developed side effect is four times more by just looking at your gene. Is that applicable in everyday practice? Can we do that every day? Can we test it same as we test blood pressure and EKG? Well, that brings me to, can, that, can we fill this gap? Proud to be at Cleveland Clinic where we are the first to publish a really clinical study that can look at the genetic pharmacogenomics and how we apply it on everyday practice. That's the only study available right now in the literature, looking at pharmacogenetic guided analgesic in major abdominal surgery. Delaney was the lead. He's uh, our uh, head of colorectal surgery. Now, what did we do? Historic group, we have already ERAS pathway that we do it. ERAS, the expedited recovery after surgery pathways. So we look at 47 patients who had laparoscopic open colorectal surgery with ventral hernia repair. They have their ERAS protocol, and it was an opioid sparing protocol. We try to reduce opioid, mainly NSAIDs, cabapentin, paracetamol. Okay, and we look uh, at so, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, okay. but actually we overcrossed the timing. All right, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But in a future, in my mind, the future is you're going to have to be pharmacogenomic guided in order to write. Oh, sorry. It our goal describes the right drug at the right dose to the right patient. Pharmacogenomics will help you achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much. أقرر شكر للأستاذ الدكتور أحمد شاش والدكتورة مها جميل وجميل أعضاء ال organs committee والأساتذة زملاء العزلاء في الأصل العين على دوتهم الكريم.